reorient. And it's a very provocative statement for the time. Uh, basically, Andrew Gunn de Frank is the person who thought up the idea of the development of underdevelopment. That underdevelopment is a process whereby the, the imperialist countries have underdeveloped Africa, Asia, Latin America, and so forth, and pushed them backward <coughs> in terms of economic development. So he wrote this book called Reorient. And his position is that if you go back, as she pointed out, to the 18th century, China was the largest uh, economy in the world. But come the Opium Wars and all that, we saw very graphically, that's been pushed backwards. And it's just like he says, well, that's not going to continue because you know Asia is like 60% of the world population. The United States is like 5%. Asians are just as smart, just as capable, and everything as Europeans. So what's going to happen is in the 21st century is the world economy is going to reorient itself. It's going to focus again on Asia. And it's a really good pro uh, statement. I, I, I was greatly influenced by that. And I think what you gave us kind of substantiates that idea. We're just in the process of reorientation. It's not, you know, it's just a natural law, basically. In the way Frank talks about it, I found that very interesting. So I just wanted to share that. Um, yeah, I had a couple of things. Um, as you may know, there's a lot of publicity about the coronavirus, and uh, there's some blame of China as not uh, letting people, well, not efficiently containing it, but also uh, suppressing what they call, what the media is calling free speech about uh, people uh, showing the coronavirus and, and it being stopped and, and, and their statements about it. Um, could you comment on that? And then it seems like China now has some, this is a second question, completely different. But China has its own uh, role in uh, dominating other countries in the sense of it's in <laughs> Africa uh, with some projects. And there have been, I've seen footage of, of pretty terrible working conditions under the Chinese uh, in Africa, et cetera, if you had anything to say about that. So those are the two things. Of course, the coronavirus is a big deal, but it, it's, it's affecting everyone here due to the supply chain uh, perception by the market and, and all of this, and fear and grief. Well, fear. <laughs> so. Well, I, I mean, um, what, can, what can I say? Uh, I, I'm not surprised at, that the Western press makes a big deal of either of those things, right? It's kind of part of the narrative. Um, in ter I don't know a lot about uh, China's investment in Africa. I do know that uh, the one idea was that uh, China was trying to create uh, debt dependence. And there was only, when you look at that carefully, as I understand it, there's only one instance of that, and that's in Sri Lanka. And that has been remedied by loan forgiveness, more or less. So that, you know, you know, it's kind of like uh, the, the the dominant narrative is, uh, you know, if if we if the West did this did this horrible thing in colonialism, then <coughs> how could anybody be better than us? China must be doing the same thing. I think that's where it comes from, and the coronavirus in the, the same the same way. I mean, what happened in the early days of the coronavirus in in Wuhan? Mm -hmm is unclear. Uh, China itself has said, you know, we didn't pay enough attention to what was said right away. They sacked the local officials. Mm -hmm. They've created, a, you made a hero of Dr. Yi, who, who tried to, or Dr. Li, I guess it was, who, war, who tried to warn uh, the local officials about what was going on. But, you know, those kinds of screw-ups happen everywhere. We, ju we see the CDC doesn't have enough masks. We see right here that there's, we still don't have enough tests. Not only the CDC doesn't have enough tests to, 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 to diagnose people who need diagnosis in, in California, but California's governor didn't, uh, good solid Democrat, didn't make uh, any provisions for that either. And uh, I know one case I, you know, of, a, of a guy who had a serious pneumonia and 
a few weeks ago, and I thought, boy, he must, he, he must have been tested. They let him out. Mm -hmm. There was no test. Right, but that's what I've noticed. So, you know, uh, is that a function? Does that indicate that our whole system is rotten? Because that's the idea, right, for the China thing. This whole system is rotten because there was a, a screw up at the beginning, an admitted screw up. So the admitted screw up is, when I say admitted, that means there's space for self criticism. Is China perfect? Obviously not. But uh, it seems like what they've done it is, uh, you know, the, I, when I take, I take, in the midst of all this noise, uh, I, t I take the word of the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization has said routinely now, China has done an admirable job. It should be a, uh, a, a model for the world. And of course, the China bash should say, oh, China's bought off the World Health Organization. <laughs> right. But what about in Africa, as I, as I said, it was- Can we go on? Uh, please, I'm sorry you're interrupting. I know, but, can we go on? Uh, I'm speaking with him. Okay. Uh, can I just like define a little bit more? There were exploitative uh, labor situations I was talking about in, in mm, Africa. Well, I don't know anything oh, about okay, that. Fine. Okay, fine. Okay. Uh, this is the second part to her question. Uh, yeah, yeah, because that was uh, documented, but okay. you know, there's yeah. no response. So Norma. Excuse you're me, you're right. Um, there, I got a comic strip, a uh, cartoon today uh, showing uh, Trump saying how good the thing was between him and uh, North Korea. He loved uh, the exchange that they had about how good uh, a person Xi is, Xi Jinping, about how clever and capable Trump, uh, Putin is in Russia. And then it's got a little figure down here showing Bernie saying, well, Cuba did a good thing. And then everybody's talking about how Trump, how Bernie is a communist because he said that. That's, that's what the cartoon is. Huh. Also, there's another uh, uh, interesting thing that I think probably everybody here knows about. Uh, one of the most dangerous uh, to Earth manu is manufacturing um, cement. And China is going out of its way to manufacture an alternative as it builds other things. We know that. Any comment on that from you? No, um, but I, I do want to go back just for a second to this this question of what's happening in Africa and what happened really in uh, in uh, Wuhan and, and also what happened what what were the circumstances of in Hong Kong? My just to state a personal view. My view is that. We, it's hard enough for me to understand what the hell is going on in my society. I have no hopes for understanding what's going on in another society. And then when it's taking place so far away with cultural and language barriers, whether it's in India, whether it's in China, whether it's even in Latin America, which is pretty close, I have no way of really what's, knowing what's going on. So I only know one thing. I know that we should stay out of there. I'm a kind of a Ron Paul guy. It's none of our business. It's none of our business to enforce human rights. It's none of our business. Let's, and every time historically we do it, things just get worse for the poor people there. So that's, I don't think we can know what's going on in those places. There's a huge propaganda apparatus that wants to tell us certain things and not others. Okay. Thank you very much for the, <clears throat> for the talk. It was very informative. Can we get your slides? Especially, can you give us the URL for the YouTube of the, uh, of the comparison of different countries over the last century? That was fascinating. I'd like to have a copy of that URL, and I'll ask you specifically afterwards. Um, China. Where could we do that? You could send it to him with his email. Well, I wonder whether that this can be on the website. Oh yeah. We are working on putting okay. the, his stuff <laughs> okay, onto our website. There are lots of things to be handled here. 
and we are an all-volunteer organization. Okay, I understand. Of I'll course, there's a big debate about uh, China being socialist or being capitalist or halfway in between. Right. Right. Uh, you ended your talk by saying it's not so much important whether China is socialist as China is economically powerful, and that is the threat to the United States, regardless of the ideology. My understanding is China plans to become a socialist country in about 30 years, and they have plans afoot to transform themselves, so that means they're not really socialist yet, but they're led by a party that created a Marxist revolution, so there's something there that's very important. Can you comment on the, the state of Chinese economy now vis-a-vis -vis how much is state-owned, state capitalist, or socialist, how much is privately owned, and what is the breakdown there in terms of the internal Chinese economy? Well, I, I don't know. I can think of several things to say about them. None of them is horribly original. The, 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 uh, in terms of China's rapid development since 1980, um, it, there's no question that it's using, that those are capitalist institutions and methods. And, uh, but as Karl Marx says, nothing is more powerful than capitalism at developing the productive forces. And that means development, that means getting rich. So if you want to listen to Karl, you put in capitalist kinds of uh, reforms. Uh, and so I'm of the view, you know, as like Deng Xiaoping, I don't care whether a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. And, uh, and that the point in China now is development. China needs to do that for its people. Uh, the, the, the thing that's bothersome to me is that, uh, and I'm not sure how, you know, there is growing inequality. In, in, in China, but there's also, as far as I can understand, a, a, in, even Bernie praises China for this, a deep commitment to getting people out of poverty. We used to have an anti-poverty program. We don't even talk about that anymore. But this is, the, you know, by 2020, extreme poverty is, is set to be gone, and they've been on schedule for that as far as what, what, what we know, and it, which is you know, limited, but it seems, and th there's some concern because the virus might postpone that a bit. So, uh, so far, a rising tide has lifted all boats in China. Lifted some boats more than others, but uh, I don't think the average person is going to complain because someone is getting richer than he is as long as he or she is doing better. So, uh, and as far as, you know, what, you, what label you're going to put on it, uh, I mean, that's, that's, you know, it, it, dep it depends on the person, you know, it's, these labels are call it very plastic. Call it communism. Call it communism. Call, call it whatever you want, but it, it, it's, it, it has done a lot for the people and has presented a certain model for the peoples of the world. And one thing you can say is that China's grown and developed and maintained its sovereignty. And I'm not sure that any other thing, and here, this is going way out on a limb. I, don't, I shouldn't even be commenting on this. That, there's anything other than China, than the Communist Party that can preserve China's sovereignty. And without that sovereignty, I don't think it can do much more in terms of development. That's my view, but who knows? I, I don't, that's, I shouldn't. Well said. Ask me something about membranes. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Dave, and I'm a Tel Aviv Assembly member. Uh, I'm Labor Council and a member of Veterans for Peace. And yesterday, uh, I know the Veterans for Peace has been very uh, uh, strong on, uh, on presenting things in a, in a more objective way about China. They're doing the opposite of China bashing. They're basically, uh, you know, supportive 
of the efforts of other countries to uh, better their situation. And uh, I think uh, yesterday at Union Square and before that at uh, uh, Portsmouth Square Park in San Francisco, there was a huge demonstration. I don't know how many, it was 500 or maybe more. I see we have at least 500, maybe it's 1,000 people. And it was mainly organized by the organizations in, uh, in the Chinese community, including uh, kind of like uh, uh, more, I guess, what we consider more right-wing organizations and, and left-wing organizations that are in between. There was a united <coughs> statement saying no racism against China, uh, which has been uh, uh, dominating the media and a lot of the statements of U.S. politicians. And so it was a, a I, I went to the demonstration, it was, I only saw a few people who I would describe as left-wingers who were there, and not faulting them, you know, but what's going on. But, uh, 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 but I think it was very significant that, uh, uh, and I know there have been, uh, uh, organizations on the left that have taken a, a stance against anti-Chinese racism and anti-China uh, uh, propaganda, uh, and, and people have fallen back into this very reactionary development. And so it was very encouraging to me that the Veterans for Peace uh, is taking a stand uh, uh, against the, this kind of uh, reactionary uh, uh, response uh, to something that, that a disease that just happened to start in China. Can I make a remark? Oh, yes, go ahead. Because you mentioned that uh, Veterans for Peace, which I'm also a member of Singh Chapter, as you, has taken a better stand than a lot of organization on, on, on China. Uh, I would say the East Bay Chapter has taken a better stand. And that's due to people like you, a little bit to people like me, especially, especially to Gene. Especially to Gene. Right. For a long time, and in a principled way. And so, uh, you know, when Hong Kong came up, we said, we said, hands off Hong Kong. We made that statement. We issued the statement. We also, as you know, co-sponsored that rally yesterday. Now, I, I wish that San Francisco uh, VFP did not say hands off Hong Kong, and uh, National VFP Veterans for Peace has not said hands off Hong Kong. To me, the bottom line for any left or progressive organization is non-intervention. And if they can't say that, they say, well, there's division in the organization. That's a pretty bad division. That means that this humanitarian imperialism is alive and well in, in national GFP, in VFP. So uh, we need more people like you and Gene. Unless media. Can I just uh, make one? Okay. I just want to say we're a diverse organization, different political perspectives, more, they're, this not on the radar. For them, they have other concerns such as Venezuela and so forth. I understand. But we're working on it. We're working on it. You're working on it, especially. Right. Turn off that machine when you get a chance to. Not right now. Okay. Call on someone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you have a quick, I just quick one. Say, yeah. say that the chapter of the, uh, Veterans for Peace in San Francisco, one of the leading members is Mike Wong. He was one of the organizers of the demonstration uh, yesterday. And, and Mike tried very hard to get a, a statement in San Francisco adopted hands off Hong Kong, but it wasn't possible. So he's working on it. Rich, you want to speak for now rather than wait your turn? Oh, you have something? Whatever. I, I, when, when we go back, I thought we were just choosing. Why don't we go one at a time? I'm fine. Okay. So, Karen? Oh, okay. So, you know, when you were showing the, the shifting economic power and and uh, it was pretty dramatic the way China went from here to here and back to here and I'm just thinking in terms of what the factors are 
uh, and also in comparison to the Soviet Union and Russia, because it seems like you know it started around the same time, around 1988-89, when the Soviet Union broke up, and Russia really did very poorly. Whereas at the same time, China began to grow exponentially as far as <coughs> economic power works. Um, one, one of the things that has been a puzzle in my mind, and I think you can look at cultural as well as political factors, but I'm wondering if you or, or anybody has a thought on the role of the Cultural Revolution under Mao and what that may have done to prepare the society for this kind of rapid expansion, or whether it was whether it was completely irrelevant, I, I don't have a handle on that. I just wonder if anyone. Well, I think it's. I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I can only tell you. Virtually everybody I, I've spoken to on, at the times so I was in China, um, maybe with one exception, was really very much against the Cultural Revolution and thought it did tremendous damage. Mm -hmm. People are yeah. resentful that they didn't get <clears throat> some didn't get an education. So I, at the time, now I was younger. I thought this is a great idea. I'm afraid I was wrong once again, and uh, it. Uh, I don't think it was. But I think it, what, and, and nor do I think the Great Leap Forward. I think both of those things did damage. Um, maybe Mao should have retired a little sooner than he did, but. The Mao era, it brought literacy to, to virtually all of China. Uh, it brought uh, women's equality virtually overnight. It got rid of uh, diseases that can be handled by public health measures like schistosomiasis and malaria. Those were big achievements. And that educational, I would, I would guess that the educational basis uh, uh, was laid during that period for the high level of, of workers that China has nowadays. So uh, that's my opinion. I don't know. I'm not a scholar. I mean, on that, I don't really. Marla? I could just say that the parallels of what you just said are in Cuba. And if you go. But I did want to say <coughs> I, had, I had the flu when all this was virus is going on. I saw two different doctors. And each one said, well, you don't have, you don't have corona, you, have better, you just have a flu, and you know, it'll go away, mm -hmm. and like Trump. By magic, maybe. No. <laughs> so, um, but, and I did happen to share with one of these doctors, I said, there's such tremendous negativity to China now, and racism. Everybody says, have you been to China? Have you been around a Chinese person? Have you gone to a Chinese restaurant? None of that was true, you know? And I didn't even know, hey, so I didn't have coronavirus. So anyway, um, they don't have a test? They don't have a test. <laughs> Kaiser doesn't have a test. Well, I didn't have pneumonia. <laughs> Anyway, so I've I've got I've got clear sailing. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I appreciate very much your presentation of these economic facts, <coughs> and uh, I think it's very useful. But um, uh, I think we have to recognize the limits of that those facts because they're they're bourgeois facts, not because they're not facts, but because they represent the the bourgeois look look at things, and so they. Um, uh, underplay the systemic differences. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping was doing the same thing. I think it makes a really big difference what system uh, they have. And it's hard to measure the advantages. That there's a level of development of China and socialist countries that's higher than the economic <coughs> factors uh, um, indicate. I mean, even Cuba, I would argue, has a higher standard of living than the United States um, in some ways, even though Cubans don't. But 
Certainly, one could say, probably, would, would argue against it. But um, um, anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. For instance, well, the uh, the, the PPP, the even per capita economic um, uh, figures don't really capture the quality of life of the people, which is which is not really possible to capture in in numerical terms. They've tried to do this happiness index or something, something like that, but I, I don't think it. It's maybe a little bit better, but um, we have it's all it's all uh, uh, qual not qualitative, not quantitative. Anyway, that's going to come. Well. <coughs> yeah, Roger. Roger, you're next. Okay. Well, thank you for an ex excellent presentation, and um, I've also read some of the things that you have out in the blogosphere, so I was, had high expectations of that book. Um, correct expectations. Um, I, went, I might make a comment, but I just had one real quick question. And is that, was your medical specialty ophthalmology by any chance? The reason why I ask is because the slides were sort of like the eye test. Right, and I failed. I was worried about that. <laughs> I was worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I would think that if you gave this presentation again, you would take that criticism to heart. Well, I, the, 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 I, I will say that you know, I, I didn't, um, I didn't make a lot of these graphics myself. I picked them up from pla from other places and. Uh, Actually, I had in mind, over the years, uh, Physicians for National Health Program developed a slide presentation uh, for Medicare for All, for single payer. And we must have given that, or I know we gave it, in thousands, if not tens of thousands of venues. So I'm thinking a little bit, maybe we should try to develop a series of presentations like that about China. But the graphics would have to be more uniform and simpler. I I I agree. I this this is more political point. Um, I think both in the presentation and more so in, in the Q and A, there's a conflation between economic size and economic power, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's, it's an important theoretical distinction that we should make that that China indeed is a major Economy, but there was still one imperialism, and there's one U.S. imperialism, and, and has world hegemony, um, and it, it's 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 and it's hurting the world. Um, and I, I should just make a, a pitch for David, because actually the one who's pushing this, but it's about U.S. sanctions. Today. Very good. Um, and close to a quarter of the countries of the world are suffering terribly. Uh, in, in Venezuela right now, which has a fairly advanced economy, tens of thousands of people are dying a day this year just from lack of food and medicines that are due to U.S. sanctions. Because there is a single world economy dominated by the world's superpower. So this program is on um, Saturday, March 14th. Um, there's flyers out here that people should pick up and, and go to that. Um, I was amazed when I looked at one of the ways that U.S. Um, exercises its hegemony, its power, economic power, is that the world economy is denominated on the, on the U.S. dollar. And I was amazed to see these statistics. And, and Raj, maybe you'll, you'll correct me there, but I believe that we saw that 2% of the world economy is denominated on the U.N. Um, 81% on the U.S. dollar. So there is an important thing to understand the difference between the size of economy yes. and economic power. And I'll just leave it at that. I mean, that very I comment. Yes, I, and I think, you know, um, one of the things I think uh, China's very interested in is maintaining the stability of Yuan because that is the uh, without that, you can't really 
have your currency be an international currency widely accepted. And I think that and the fact that I didn't go into this, there's so much foreign direct investment going into China, no longer so much because of its low wages, but for a variety of reasons, one of which is that it's regarded as stable and reliable, and that is going to give the currency more power. But more importantly, the thing about sanctions, that's really, I, that's really good. I'm glad you raised that. And I, I, that's another place where non-intervention comes in. Uh, how can you be a non-interventionist and say we should, we should slap sanctions on any country or person that doesn't behave the way <coughs> we want them to behave? That doesn't, that doesn't fit. So that's, I think that's really great. Uh, we're going to continue uh, with like the other questions. Roger, we're not getting it. Uh, yeah, you will, will come back. Adam? Oh, sorry. Tony. Um, fascinating stuff. Uh, and I just want to follow up uh, on the previous question. It has to do with uh, the presentation being kind of tantalizing uh, with all this presentation of the aggregate statistics. But um, uh, what I was interested in hearing more getting your opinion about was the, the export of capital, uh, bank uh, lending, uh, because it strikes me that this is the uh, cutting edge of the antagonism between the United States and China. So I was wondering if you have an opinion about that. I don't know, but I did notice in the, you know, uh, I think, uh, yeah, let's see, in, in terms of foreign direct investment coming out of which is export again, coming out of the different countries in the world. Um, it varies a lot from year to year. And as a matter of fact, I, looking at last year, um, you see, I think, um, I think, yeah, China was number one, Japan was number two. If you look at the list, the United States isn't there. It exported negligible amount of capital last year. And I was surprised when I saw that, but I think, I suspect, that's Trump trying to make sure that investment stays in the United States and not getting exported. So, you know, that's, that's, all, that's a little surprise. It was really surprising to me. And then if you look at foreign direct investment into or out of a country, but especially into a country, out of a country, well, both, but out of a country, the history of empire is really important. I mean, you know, number one up there is usually the Netherlands. Now, the Netherlands has just done this accumulation over the centuries, and what it's how it's moving capital around, how much of it is moving for itself or other countries. Or, it's a very complicated question, I think. I couldn't, I really couldn't, I couldn't discuss that. It's too, it's too, but I was surprised we're not, ex we didn't export any capital in 2018. No longer. Steve. Steve. Yeah, um, not much. I mean, thanks for the great presentation. Um, is, uh, is China become a lot more uh, environmentally sustainable? And also, is China keeping up with the U.S. in regards to robot technology? <laughs> well, I don't know about the environment. I know I have a very good friend who uh, left China years ago, and she is, remains very upset about the problem with the environment. But it is also true that every country that went through industrialization went through a period of awful pollution. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. And that was the year of the steel mill. And I remember there were days when you drove in a part of town that wasn't far from the steel mills. You, on a cloudless day at noon, you better put your headlights on because it was hard to see. So that's not so long ago. <laughs> not so long ago. And uh, so that's a, again, that's a difficult, you know, that's a really, Difficult. What was the other thing? Robot technology. Well, yeah, China is really Man. building robot, the building and buying robots at a fierce pace. So, 
I th that's part of China 2025. I think they understand that very clearly, although I really don't know. I just see what's on the surface. Rich. Okay. <coughs> so, contrary to every time I've ever spoken that I remember, I made a list today, so I'm going to bring it. I'm going to try to be brief. I'm going to touch a bunch of things. You can pick one or two. I don't care how you respond. Can you speak up louder so I can capture it? No, okay, so the first thing.